Good morning, Living Word Church. With everything that has breath, praise the Lord. It's a new song. Try it together. Praise in the valley, and I praise on the mountain. I praise in the shore, and I praise when I'm doubting. I praise when I'm numbered, and praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the water, my enemies drowning. But as long as I'm breathing, I got a reason. of all the turmoil, he chooses to praise God. Not because of his circumstance, but in his circumstance, right? So verse 2 says this, I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. So here's King David praising God in, in, in the midst of all these guys that are around him. They're scared too, but he chooses to praise. And what happens is they see him praising, they're encouraged, and they begin to join in with him, right? So verse 3, it says, glorify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. So here, they've watched him in the cave, they've watched him in fear, and they've watched him praise God amidst all that. They've been encouraged, and now they're unified in the idea that God is who he says he is. That God is their safe place and their refuge, and that they can trust him, amen? So this morning, let's worship together, and let's try to sing this by faith if you need to, all right? Praise cause you saw Praise cause you reign Praise cause you rose and defeated the rain I'll praise cause you faithful I'll praise cause you true I'll praise cause there's nobody greater than me I'll praise cause you saw I'll praise cause you reign I'll praise cause you rose and defeated the rain I'll praise cause you're faithful I'll praise cause you're true And I'll praise cause there's nobody greater
everybody doing okay today? Say yeah. yeah. Are you ready to praise the Lord? Yeah. I, oh, well, some of y'all have not decided yet. So let me tell you, this is the place to do it. So if you're glad to praise the Lord, come on, let's make some noise for our God together today. Amen. Well, Kevin and I and a lot of the staff and friends were at a conference early in the week up in Oklahoma City where we sang this with about 500 pastors in the room and we blew the roof off. So this is a great song. I hope, here's the only thing, it was stuck in my head all week. And uh, by now I'm like, oh, we're doing this again. Yay. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, so I, I put that on you now. Hopefully this will be in your head all week. It's a great one to have rolling over in your heart and your head all week long, the praise of our God, and we want it to be continually on our lips. My name is Freddie. I'm a pastor here. If you are a guest of ours, we are so glad you're here. We'd love to have a record of your visit. I like to send you something personally in the mail, so the only way I can do that is if you fill out a Connect card, and there's some of those physically in the seat. There's also a QR code on the back of the seats there. If you see somebody come in after we get started here, remind them and help them know that. Uh, we'd love to have a record of your visit. If you want to communicate to one of us, the staff, do that same thing on the Connect card and we will receive that. So if you're worshiping online, Pastor Kit is our online pastor. Wave to the people in the room, Kit. Kit is always Woo! online. So yeah, we're thankful for Pastor Kit communicating with all of our people online. If you're worshiping with us online, fill that Connect card out. We'd love to hear from you as well. I want to give you a moment this morning to turn, welcome somebody into God's house. Shake a hand, hug a neck, high five, do it now. And then we will sing some more together. Oh 
the hands that won't let go. You are the calm within my storm. You are the love that will endure. You are the victor in the fight. Over the dark, over the night. You are the hope I'm hanging on. You are my everlasting song.
much. I'm, there we go. There we go. Good morning. Um, so recently I have started taking a worship class uh, as part of the steps I need to take towards my ordination someday. And what I've been learning about this last week was about how when we enter into a place of worship, um, essentially what we need to do is we need to come in and we need to ground ourselves. Um, I'm reading a book called The Worship Plot by Dan Boone, and it talks about how if you don't know where you are, you don't know what you're doing. And so the first thing that we do when we come into the house of the Lord in the place of worship is we, we need to remind ourselves why we're here um, or why we should be here. Maybe we come in because we want to be filled up with something good, but I want to remind you that the purpose of the house of the Lord is because he is good. And we are here to experience him and to have relationship with him. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray and the altars are open. But what I am doing is I'm giving you a, a window into the conversation that I'm having with God um, so that you can have a conversation with him too. Not so that you can just listen to my words. Um, and yes, my words are for you and I'm praying for you, but also so that Maybe there's something that I say in my prayer that, that reminds you of who he is or something about him and, and encourages you to have your own conversation. So that's what I'm going to do. As I'm just going to open this window for you to see what's in my heart. And if it, if it resonates with you, I just invite you to carry on with God about it. Um, Lord, I just want to thank you for this church and this congregation and their willingness to come into this building. Um, one, to just do life together and, and hear about each other's lives and see how everyone's doing, but two, God, to connect with you. That is what we're here for. We're here because we love you and we want to have a relationship with you, God. As I listened to the song this morning um, that said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see a victory, I, I want to praise you because I am in a place in my life right now where things are good, but I know that there have been times in my life where things have not been good. And I know that in those times you have always carried me through and you will continue to carry me through. So I pray that if anyone in this room is in a place where things are not going good or not going the way that they want, that they would lay those situations at your feet and that you would meet them and bring peace and comfort in those situations today, God. I pray for the, the ones in the room who are in a place like me where we're just celebrating all of the goodness that you have done, God, that you would just be so present in your conversations with them this morning, reminding them of everything that you have done. I thank you again for just this opportunity to come together and to, to see who you are and to, to be reminded of your goodness. It is in your sweet and holy name I pray. Amen. Spirit of the Lord is real. Amen. You can be seated. Sorry, I had to hand off my sleeping grandbaby. I used to say, man, I loved when my kids were small and they'd fall asleep in church because I thought there's no better place to fall asleep than the presence of the Lord. And uh, whether we're awake or tired, listen, if you fall asleep during my sermon, you will not be the first. So... I am, I am really good at putting people to sleep when they need it. So, uh, so I say, hey, I'd rather you fall asleep here and uh, get a little bit of the Holy Spirit than, than somewhere else. So the Lord is really good to us, and I appreciate Emily's words this morning. She is a leader and a pastor in this church, and I appreciate her sharing her own experiences of her journey with us today. And as we go a little further uh, today in something that's a new season for us, um, it really is the songs that we've sung, and, and we're going to do one more that has to do with this, um, but the, the words that she spoke even uh, have to do with what we're talking about in this uh, series called Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table. We're going to dive into that in just a few moments, so my heart is that you would be prepared, that God's uh, helping you be a listener to what he wants to say throughout our entire worship time together today. We're going to... Um, take a moment and give in just a few minutes, and so I hope that you'll uh, worship through that, but even be a listener in that. Ask God. Let Him lead you. Um, a lot of times what we do in our worship is we, we give uh, in our worship to what's comfortable for us, 
and we do it because that's a discipline and it's obedient. But I encourage you to think about ways that you can stretch yourself in your giving. And I don't just mean financially. Church, can I tell you today that we have so much momentum and so many things are happening in the life of this church and we need you to give of yourself to some of these things. If you are a person who sits on your hands, a part of this Living Word family that Freddie Wright pastors, you're probably not gonna last. I'm just gonna be real honest with you because the culture is gonna be that we serve all, all of the time. And if you don't have a place you're serving, it's not that you're doing a bad thing, it's that you're missing out. We have a couple hundred people now gathering on a Wednesday night. We have about 40 kids that are gathering on a Wednesday night. If you're bilingual, we absolutely need you. And we're talking to our Spanish-speaking church about helping serve with our kids on Wednesday night because we have a ton of kids and teens who are coming to this place. And most of us would say, that's what we want. But if we really mean that's what we want, then we put ourselves in a serving position to show that's what we want. And so if you're not serving, now if you are, I'm not asking you to burn yourself out. But if you're not serving, we need you. Let me just tell you something. If you're of a certain age, and I won't mention the age because I'm not trying to, to like make anybody leave, but if you're a person of a certain age, there is no reason that you can't be in the nursery once every six weeks. That would be a perfect place for you to serve and hold babies. If you're retired, oh my goodness, what an amazing way to serve. So I'm asking you, I don't like begging, I don't think it looks good, but I'm, I'm not above it. Uh, <laughs> But I'm asking you, I'm always putting the needs before you because we're a family. And if I'm the uh, husband or dad of a family and I don't tell my family what's going on in the family, then I'm not a good dad or husband. And if I'm a pastor, a shepherd to you, and I don't put the needs before you that are real, that are helping people, then I'm not a good pastor. Because I should be empowering you to serve. So on Sunday mornings, we got people running all over this place doing things. Now Wednesday night, we do too. And we need help. Uh, we've got a few people serving over there that are doing a wonderful job and telling me that they are on the brink of not knowing what to do next. Uh, and so we want to help them. So if that's you, come talk to me. Come talk to Pastor Jessica. Come talk to Pastor Andy over in the kids area. There's many people who can lead you to the right person to figure out how to do that. Or just fill out one of those connect cards and say, I hear you. I want to help. And even if you don't want to help, you should. Uh, because it's good for us. So that's my plea today. Pastor Jessica, we've got some announcements to make before we take offering this morning. We and do. so uh, we want to remind you a couple things. What do, what do we have first on tap? Do you remember? We have man camp and women's retreat. Yes, it's the fall. So these mm -hmm. kind of times are for fall type retreats. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested as a woman and want to go to ladies retreat, you can uh, uh, scan that QR code, and I'm sure you can get information there. We also have man cam. We're going to show, I think, a video of that in a little bit mm -hmm. uh, that has to do with that. So if you want to go to either one of those, the, the prices are good right now. I think yep. the man camp is cheaper now. Man, man camp is good. Women's retreat is coming up, but they've uh, extended the deadline. Oh, very so good. Very good. still register for that. We also have on your seats. Yes. Get that card. we got trunk or treat coming up. Everybody say woo woo for trunk or treat. We got a good time. It's one of our best times to uh, to reach out to our community, yep. and so we want you to know about it. But what are ways that people can get involved? Well, there's several things. So that card that's on your seat, it's good for you to have that information. But what we really want you to do with it is take that and use it to invite somebody else. Yes. So if you have family members, you have neighbors, you have friends from school, whatever it is, uh, your kids' friends from school, take that card and give it to somebody else and invite them. If you want more cards, that's great. We have more at the welcome desk, so come see us and get one of those. Um, also, we need people to serve. Mm -hmm. so we have thousands of people who come to this event every year, and so we need a couple of things. We need volunteers to help with things like registration and the parking lot and greeting and things like that. Uh, but then we also need people to do trunks. Yes, creative Which is the really people. fun part. <laughs> and even if they're not creative, we'll give them ideas. Well, and here's the thing. Nowadays, you can go on Oriental Trading or Amazon and look up Trunk or Treat, and there are trunk kits. 
yeah. that you can just buy. Wow. And it I, gives you all year, the things you need. <laughs> last year I learned that that's a Pinterest thing, that people go yes. on Pinterest and get ideas. Yes. Yeah. It does not have to be fancy. It's supposed to be fun. Right. It's a safe way for kids to trick or treat and, um, and do it and, and connect with our church through, uh, through that. So and, and, and you don't even have to do something fancy. You know, like, no. like you can get a big mustache and open your trunk, put the mustache on there. That'd be plenty for me. I think that that's would be great. That's my style. Just, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And so, if you want it to like a Freddy, just get a beard too and put it all the whole deal. Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, so there is, if you scan the QR code on the seat backs or we have them on the welcome desk out there, you can get the link to register your family. You can get the link to register to uh, be a volunteer or you can register to do a trunk. And um, Pastor Andy will pass along more information depending on what you select. And the last That's thing is candy. Oh, we and the need candy. candy. Lots and lots I and lots. I bought three bags this week and it equaled up to almost a thousand pieces. And we need like hundreds of thousands of pieces. Yes. So we have, we've partnered. It's not, I'm not just asking you to do this. We've partnered with our community. We already have the library that's turned in some stuff. Yep. Uh, we have uh, schools we're trying to get involved in this. Businesses to help do candy drives. Candy's expensive. Listen, it's not going to help when you walk in and go, oh my gosh, it's gone up. We know everything's gone up. So we need each other, right? So commit some money to, to the candy. And I will say, you know, chocolate is more expensive. Oh. And so avoid the chocolate because it melts outside anyway. Oh, yeah. So. Buy dum-dums. Get the cheap candy yes, <laughs> that has lots of pieces. That's yes. what we really, really need. We need as many pieces yes. as possible. Yes. So bring uh, candy in. There's going to be collection out there in yep, the Yep, there are bins out there in the foyer, so you can drop that off anytime. If you want to drop off during the week, if you happen to be driving by, stop in the church office, and yeah. we'll love to take that. Then, yeah. So. Um, last thing I wanted to mention, there's so much going on and we could spend all our time doing the announcements. We don't want to do that. It's super boring. So, you know, just endure this for a minute. But uh, Wednesday nights, I told you super exciting things going on. One of our new adult offerings for English speaking is a parent, uh, a parent of teens class. And uh, Chrissy is, Pastor Chrissy, who you see up here a lot, she is teaching that class. And it is open to anyone who wants to gather together, kind of support group feel, but also diving into the scriptures. And uh, they had their first meeting this last Wednesday night, and a few of them gathered for that. So any of the parents of teens, man, gather in, get to know each other. And uh, it's more than just that class. It's using each other to, to encourage one another, maybe, you know, through the week, too. So that's one of the offerings. Anything else we need to know? I don't think so, right? I think that's it. All right. We are ready to take offering this morning. You can do it digitally by the things that are on the screen there. That's the way I give. You can give in the house. There'll be buckets being passed. Guys, come on forward and uh, receive our morning offering. Let's pray over this offering. God, we are so thankful that you lead the way with irrational generosity. You gave so much for us, and we want to return that back to you. We are blessed beyond measure, God. We have so much, and Lord, forgive us for not recognizing that and help us to use those things. We talked about giving our time, and Lord, we do want to give of our finances as well. So Lord, we pray that we would know in our hearts it's more blessed to give than to receive. So bless it this morning. Help us to know that you are a God of abundance, that you own everything, Lord. You own the, the cat on a thousand hills. It was just a picture of how massive you are and what you own. And Lord, we want to be part of your abundance, Lord. And so we give of our abundance. We have a lot. So help us to give. It's not, it's not just equal giving, it's equal sacrifice. And we want to give beyond what is comfortable. Help us, Lord, to do that. Whether we're online today or in the house, Help us to give an obedience to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It's a table you prepared for me. Presence of my enemies. It's your body and your blood shed for me. This is how I fight my battle. Try this with me. The set for me in the presence of my enemies. In the presence of my enemy. It's your body, it's your body, and your blood shed for me. This is how I fight my battles. 
close together. This is how I fight my battles. Sing, this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. In the valley. In the valley, I know you're with me. Surely goodness and your mercy follows me. By weapons of praise, thanks to me. Sing, this is how I fight my battles. And I believe you'll become. Sing, I. spiritual battle and the enemy is trying to wedge his seeds of doubt fear anger and distrust into your consciousness he is trying to get a seat at the table of your mind so that he can lead you down paths he wants you to travel on the good news is that you don't have to go there you can win this battle but first 
you have to recognize what you are up against. Amen. All right. Well, we've got some things to cover today, and so we're going to jump right in here in a moment. I want to remind you to uh, prepare yourself to take some notes, and uh, thank you. And so uh, remember, we remember things that we write down, most of us better than the things that we just hear. So we do provide notes for you each week. And I hope during this series, this sermon season, that you will uh, take some notes with me and, and realize some of these things that maybe you'll be thinking about during the week, not just on Sundays. I like to start with something funny each week. So I've got some memes for you. My family, hey, they didn't give us much fries. Me in the car earlier. <laughs> Anybody guilty of that? Uh, for $5, you can either get your girl approximately two flowers from a florist, or you can get her an entire Costco rotisserie chicken. That's all I'm saying. The choice is yours, ladies. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know you're old when you're entering your birth year online and have to spin that thing like you're on the Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> yes. Guys be like, the man, the myth, the legend, and it's just their pal, Greg. Yeah, that Greg. We have a Greg. Uh, how do you sleep at night knowing people don't like you? Me, with the fan on. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> That's me all day. Uh, we're only 50 days away from Carolina basketball. Oh, how did that get in there? I don't, that was an accident. That was an accident. Keep going. Uh, when God created ducks, he said, waterproof that chicken and give it a kazoo. <laughs> That's a good one right there. That's a good one right there. What do you call a reluctant potato? A hesitator. Come on, man. That's a good one. You know it is. I love when I send these to Kevin ahead of time, and uh, I can tell which one are the gold because those are ones I get a little ha-ha on. Yeah, so classic right there. Oh, man. So I've been so fired up about this series. I don't know that I've had a series that I've planned so far in advance. I started reading this book uh, by a pastor named Louis Giglio. And uh, as I read it and listened to it and then got a little uh, study guide thing along with it and just really felt like, man, this is something that people need to hear, I need to hear. And so we're going to be going through this. If you want to read the book, you can use that as a supplement during our time together. It'll probably be for the next six weeks or so that we're going to be going through this. I want to ask you a question this morning. Do you ever send a text? Thanks. Uh, do you ever send a text in the heat of the moment? Uh, now, we won't get into all of that because sometimes those texts get us in trouble. But the context of what I'm talking about is, do you ever have a situation where, um, and I know most of us have probably experienced this in one way or another, but we feel like maybe people are against us, maybe there's something going on, a family argument, um, or maybe there's a gossip issue going on, uh, someone takes credit for your idea at work, or maybe there's division in the church, uh, just some things stir up, aggressive online posts, and these things happen, and they cause a certain level of angst in you. And so you start thinking about those things, and then you start thinking about, you know, who, who is on my side that I can kind of, you know, talk to real quick and get some affirmation from. And so, you know, it starts to st uh, stir up some defensiveness in us or some insecurities. We don't want to admit that, but that happens sometimes. But we all know it stirs up frustrations. And so what we tend to do these days especially, is we send a text to a trusted friend, right? Um, and we say like, man, you know, I know that I trust this person, they're my confidant, and uh, they're going to come alongside me, <laughs> they're going to affirm me, you know, we, we want that thing, and we kind of know, and so we get the phone out, and we start the text, and then we wait. And for you iPhone users, you know, you see the little bubble, Right? Now, for those of you who don't have iPhones, I don't know how you live. Because without that bubble, I don't, I don't know what I would do in life. Uh, but, you know, you kind of wait. And, uh, you know, I'm in the demographic where uh, we wait longer than the younger people do because we don't always get to our text, like, right away. Um, and so maybe you wait for a, a while. But you're hoping that that person texts back with the things that you're wanting them to. Like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, go get them. You know, all the things that we typically do. But then what happens when the person texts back something unexpected? Maybe you have friends that will tell you the truth. 
not just what you want to hear. Now, it's really nice when the truth lines up with what you want to hear. <laughs> that doesn't, that sometimes that does happen, but sometimes it doesn't. And I've gotten texts like this before, and I've sent a few, where maybe they write back, hey, don't let that other person lead you into harboring feelings of things like hostility or resentment or bitterness. Like, think about that phrase. If somebody responds back to you, don't let the other person lead you. Now, maybe it aren't isn't it those exact words, but maybe they're words like that. And they're trying to encourage us because they can tell we're worked up. We have these insecurities. We have these frustrations. We have this defensiveness. And they're trying to help us not let the other person lead us into hostility and resentment and bitterness. Now, if you're like me, when you get a text like that, sometimes, if you're not in the right frame of mind for that kind of text, you have a little bit of disappointment. I mean, if we're honest, you know, that's not really what I wanted to hear. And then we have this internal battle, depending on how mature we are, of like, yeah, that's not what I wanted to hear, but it's what I needed to hear. And, you know, but then maybe if we're not feeling very mature that day, we're like, well, who are they to say? They don't even understand me. They don't know the story, you know? I mean, sometimes I, I think to myself, did the person actually even read the text? Like to feel where I'm at in this, you know? But then after some disappointment, or maybe we're mature enough to do this immediately, but sometimes we look at that and maybe we receive that text, or this could be even in a conversation, we receive it as a gift. Have you ever done that? Have you ever done it kind of down the road when you know it's not something you want to hear, but it's something you needed to hear? Have you ever looked at it as a gift? Oftentimes, the negative emotions and jumbled thoughts that we have aren't really about the situation that we're in or that we're facing that causes us our rants that we do. It's really about what's going on in our soul. I think the situations that we face, even the people that we face, our jobs that we're at so much, our schools that we go to, sometimes we, we focus and think those are the issues. The circumstances are the issues. But oftentimes, just like anything in life, it's more than that. It's deeper than that. It's about what's going on inside. I'm always reminded of what the scriptures tell us, that God looks on the heart. What do people look on? the outward things, but God looks on the heart. And we, we like that when people are looking at us, we want God to see our heart and we understand people only look at our outward, but, but what about us? Do we only look at the outward things and attribute a lot of the frustrations to those outward things and then they cause us rants, but what's causing that rant, what's causing that explosion, what's causing that, you know, we call it in our family, we call it diarrhea of the mouth. I'm sorry the, for the, but, but sometimes that's, it's that graphic. It's that ugly. I mean, if we're being honest. And, and I like that phrase because nobody wants that. Am, am I wrong? Yeah. Nobody wants that. And yet we see it everywhere. I mean, social media is just, ugh, it's so much of that. Our echo chambers are so much of that. And even our relationships, if we're not careful, we've built that. And what, what God sees is that there's something deeper going on inside of us. And he knows that because he understands spiritual warfare, spiritual battles. And, and if, if we're not careful, sometimes we don't like to talk about that too much because it makes us seem just weirdos. Like I have a, 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 an older friend who used to always say, you know, when he would describe somebody that he thought was over-spiritual, he'd always put his hands up and go, they're just, woo. <laughs> and he'd go, you know. And I'm like, like what? Because I wanted to hear him do it again. <laughs> and he'd be like, you know, they're just, woo. And I'm like, yeah, I kind of understand. <laughs> but, but, I mean, honestly, like, there's a lot of woo in life that's real. And we're created with more than just our outward. 
We're created with more than just the flesh and the bones. We're created with souls. We're created with stuff that goes on that's deeper than our consciousness. There's the deeper than what we see physically. And we're simply just fooling ourselves if we don't at least try to understand that. Here's what this pastor says in the book that we're referencing. Pastor Louis Giglio is a pastor in Atlanta, Georgia. He started many, many years ago a, a ministry to mostly uh, college-age students called 268 Generation. And then it turned into the Passion Movement. Many of you are familiar with that. And this is what he says about this issue. He says, you are in a spiritual battle. This is on the screen for you here. And the enemy is trying to wedge his seeds of doubt, fear, anger, and distrust into your consciousness. Now, if you're going to be with me today, you're going to have to think deep. And I believe in you, and I know you can. So let this sink in. He says this. The enemy is trying to get a seat at the table of your mind so he can lead you down the paths he wants you, he wants you to travel on. The good news is that you don't have to go there. You can win this battle. But first, you have to recognize what you're up against. Now, I say this often because it's one of my very favorite childhood ministry, uh, memories, and most people don't get it because they didn't watch G.I. Joe. But if you watch G.I. Joe, at the end of every episode, which, by the way, you kids are lucky, you can stream anything you want to at any point. We had to wait for when G.I. Joe was going to come on at a certain time. You had to be in front of the television during that time. I mean, these are first world problems. Feel, feel sorry for me now. And so we watched G.I. Joe, and there was a lot of action going on, right? I mean, it was terrible, terrible graphics. But it was a lot of action going on, and there would always be a moral of the story. And at the end of the program, they would say, I mean, that's how old I am, I call it a program. Uh, at the end of the, the, the show, they would say, and now you know, and knowing is half the battle. And that always stuck with me because it's so true. Like once you know something, there's power in that. And in our spiritual warfare that, we, that exists, whether you want to acknowledge it or not, it exists. There's so much like reason behind it and, and showing of itself and, and proof, I guess. I, I, I hesitate in saying the word proof because people love to try to prove things. But, but like experience tells you. It's a teacher. And I've experienced it myself. I've been with other people who experience it. I see it. I feel it. I pray about it. I interact with God about it. The Holy Spirit is a miraculous supernatural being that operates in this world that we don't always recognize. And what Louis says is, we can win this battle, but first you have to recognize what you're up against. I have a student helping me today. Who's helping me with the reading? Ah, come on, Riley. Come on, welcome her to the stage today. <laughs> Riley, what are you going to be reading for us? Um, I don't know. Psalms. You do know. <laughs> you do know. It's, it's not on the thing. Um, Psalms 23. Yeah, one yeah. Six, yeah. Okay, all right. So it's going to be on the screen for them to see. Yeah. Read slowly and, and, and help the people out today, all right? The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Somebody say amen to that. Thank her for helping us. That's our scripture reading for today. And it's going to be really our scripture that we'll connect with throughout this entire season of sermons. Um, and, I, and I want you to, to I want to help us in understanding that this is a power-packed passage. And it really has so much for us to learn. The text story that I told you really is a part of the story of the beginning of this book. And Pastor Louis talks about how that he was in the situation where he had some people he felt were coming against him. 
And he was trying to battle that, and he had a trusted friend that he knew he could text, and he tr texted that trusted friend, and he waited for the response, and the response was nine words that literally would change his life, change some of the future of the ways he would think and, and respond, and then eventually it would cause him to write this book and then preach on it. He preaches on this to places he goes and travels, and he said these nine words really can change us and I hope it does for all of us. He was feeling sorry for himself about his circumstance, but more was going on inside his soul. And the text said, don't give the enemy a seat at your table. That was the text. Nine powerful words that can have power for our lives today and in the next few weeks. That text of Louis helps lead us to the text that Riley just read to us. Because it's not a text from a friend that's going to revolutionize and transform your life like the text of the Scripture. The text of the Scripture is life-altering, life-transforming. And unfortunately, when we read something like Psalm 23 or we hear it, even if we don't have it memorized, we may have heard it so many times that it becomes just another reading of a familiar text. And I want to tell you today, just to kind of remind you, we're going to spend some time in this passage today for the next several minutes. And as we do, I want you to try to act like you're hearing this for at least, not, if not for the first time, at least for like a freshness about it. And, and maybe you're not as familiar as you think you are with it. When I think about Psalm 23, sometimes I think about cross-stitched pillows. Right? Anybody? Anybody have a grandparent who would have this cross stitched in some pillow? And you think of it, even that picture makes it seem soft. Or maybe you think of the Olin Mills Jesus. Anybody? Anybody have an Olin Mills Jesus in their house? And he's looking off into the distance and he's got this nice little sheet wrapped around his head. It looks like the kind of pillow you use when you fly on long flights. And, and he's got that, that sheep on his neck and he's got some uh, rod with a crook in it. And he's looking off in the distance as if to say, will these people ever get this? You know, like that's what some people think of when they think of this passage. Um, and, and what we really need to understand is to look at this passage with what I would call the grit and the power behind such words. Like people use this at mostly I read this at, at funerals. And I read it as a comfort. And I do believe that the scripture has the power to comfort and the comfort is not really what the words say, it's the comfort of something familiar. That's why I read it at, at funerals. That's why we sing Amazing Grace at funerals. There's a connection to a comfort of familiarity. But when we do that with familiarity, we often lose the power of a passage like this. It was written with grit, and it has power for us today. Do, do I need to remind you today, this was a psalm of David. Like David the David, right? Right? And, and David was a king, he was a warrior, he was a fighter, he was a shepherd, and he had seen difficult situations. And it's so important for us because so many of us, when we think about our own spiritual lives, what we think most about is the difficulties of life. And I'm telling you that David faced some difficulties that you haven't even seen. And this is the guy who is writing words that are relevant for us today. He had seen God work in difficult situations. He had seen that God would deliver when he said he would deliver, that he could come through like the God that he was. And so when we read this passage, when we read Psalm 23, help me not to think that this is some fluffy, soft, spiritual lullaby that many of us have kind of turned it into. It says at the beginning, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, that's Psalm 23, 1, and, and let's pause there for a minute because we're, if we're not careful, we want to go right into it because many of us do have this memorized, and so we're, you know, when we memorize something, we say it quick. We, Wednesday night, we were talking about the Lord's Prayer, and we were saying how we have memorized that, and, and you're in a, in a sports situation. You start singing, I mean, saying the Lord's Prayer. I did that when I played high school basketball, and we said, Lord, you know, uh, we'd start beginning, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, the kingdom of heaven, be done. We're trying to hurry up, right? And so the same thing happens with this. The Lord is my shepherd. We go to immediately, I shall not want. But let's, let's just hang right there for a minute. 
The Lord is my shepherd. What does this really mean? It's a reminder that we all were created to be led. We all were created to be led. And if, and if God is not leading you, it doesn't mean that someone else or something else isn't. In fact, if God is not leading you, I would declare that something else is leading you. Maybe it's someone else's opinion that's leading you. Maybe it's someone else's position on something that's leading you. Or maybe it's you that's leading you. Many of us are proud of that. I mean, that's kind of the culture of human, human people like forever, really. But, but so much so in America and in the last couple generations, you look out for number one. You stand for you. Other people are second. Like this is revolutionary to say we are people who love God and serve all. Because if we abide by what humanity says, it's like, well, we'll get to you once we take care of me. And that's not how God works. You were created to be led, but many of us, we're calling our own shots. And if you are leading your own life, then congratulations, you are your own shepherd. As one TV personality often asks, how's that working for you? <laughs> your psalm might read this, I am my shepherd. And I promise you the next line is, at some point, it would be, and I am in want. Because what I've learned about people, that even if we have a certain amount of time where we do pretty good for ourselves, when I am in charge of me, things don't go great. And here's what I want to say real quickly about that. Sometimes we look at other people, and comparison is the enemy of contentment. I say that often because I believe it true with all my heart. And sometimes we say, yeah, but Freddie, I see all these other people who are living the way they want to, and they look like they're pretty in charge of their lives. And man, they got money, they got things, they got things are going well for them, they got a marriage, they got kids, blah, 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 blah. But, but what you're doing is you're comparing everything that you know about you with all that you don't know about them. And that is a dangerous situation. And so when I would say to you that when you're in charge of you, it probably leaves you in want, you think, yeah, maybe it does for me, but it, it, it works for them. And I would say, man, be careful of that because you don't know the misery. Have you ever gotten word that someone took their own life and you were completely shocked because they looked like they had it all together? That is not an unusual thing. So, this is the beginning of this journey about not giving the enemy a seat at your table. Understanding that Jesus not only says, I am your shepherd, he wants to be your shepherd. Like, like this can be the beginning of this journey where we collectively say, okay, Jesus, you are my shepherd. I want you to be in charge of my life. I've said it before. Maybe I haven't meant it. Or maybe I've said it before and I've kind of stepped into it, but I haven't lived into it. And this is a great opportunity, an invitation to say, Jesus, I want you to be in control of my life. Because then when we say that, here's what we see as a result in the rest of this scripture. We can say, Psalm 23, 1b, I shall not want. If the Lord is my shepherd... I shall not want. What we begin to see is that like David, he didn't get everything he wanted every day, but he never lacked what he needed any day of his life. And so we're so accustomed to looking at what we don't have. Why? Because we're comparing. And that's a, that's a trick of the one who wants to get a seat at your table. But when Jesus is our shepherd, when he is in charge of my life, then I shall not want. I learn what my wants really should be. Then, when the Lord is my shepherd, here's what else happens. Verse 2 says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. When Jesus makes you do something, it is for your own good. Now stay with me here because we're getting ready to go through this. And you don't want to miss some of these really important things that can help our everyday life. When Jesus makes you do something, 
It is for your own good. I thought I learned something about putting my own kids to bed every night. Like, I didn't really put them to bed every night. I think it was a team effort. And by team, I mean mostly Shannon. All right? But as we have grandkids now, like, I wanted my kids to go to bed. These days, I'm like, Shannon, can't they stay up a little bit longer? Because I don't want my grandkids to go to bed. So Sophie's at our house last night, and it was time for bed. We had to do everything in our power to make her lie down. And so that meant, like, I, taught, I negotiated with, I could be a terrorist negotiator. I believe it. I negotiated with her for an hour. I was working her. Man, I was playing her better than I've ever played a guitar. And I was working her, trying to get her ready for bed. And then Shannon sat by the bed and sang every song she wanted to sing. And we made sure the covers were perfect and the baby doll was there. But we did it with compassion and our love for our granddaughter. And, and I know it's only going to get worse from here. I mean, my kids had pallets next to my parents' bed in Chattanooga where they would. <laughs> and as our family grew, my parents weren't planning for having so many pallets all over the room. When, when Jesus is your shepherd, he makes you lie down because it's for your own good. You, his sheep, need guidance and rest. And when he's talking about sheep here, please understand that not everything in the Bible is a compliment. And so when, when the writer here, David, is saying you are the sheep, he's not giving you a compliment. He's not calling you sheep because you're cuddly and precious. I mean, I don't know if you know much about sheep, but they don't see real well. They don't make great decisions. They're not steady on their feet. They often need help. They're kind of dumb enough to not be able to find a green pasture. Matter of fact, if you don't believe me, watch this little video of a sheep. You might have seen this on the old YouTube. Mm. <laughs> Those guys aren't speaking English, but I know they're saying the same thing. They're dumb, dumb sheep. Dumb, dumb sheep. Right? I mean, look at this. Slow mo. He's free. Nope. Nope. Anybody ever feel like that? Anybody ever feel like you got friends like that? <laughs> Family? No, don't raise your hand, okay? Some of them might be with you. Yeah. When, when, the, the usage of sheep here is not necessarily a compliment. This is what sheep are like. They are just often really, really dumb animals. And I think it's amazing that that's what we're compared to <laughs> in the scripture. There's a lot of humor in that. We're in such need. Sheep are in such need of help that we aren't smart enough to find the green pasture. And here's what's crazy. Just like a kid, the shepherd is making you do something that's really good for you. To lie down. But listen, all, all my grandbaby last night could think about was all the fun we had all day. And there's more fun to be had. So let's go. And that's kind of how we are. And, and this is an example of our shepherd leading us to something that we absolutely need, which is rest. It's peace. We don't like to be made to do anything. I mean, anybody? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I mean, if somebody just says, well, I'm going to make you, I'm like, you're going to make me do another. Right? I mean, that's kind of how we are. But this make me is something we need so that we don't crack and crumble. We need rest. We need breaks. We need good stuff. I have this quote for you here. Sometimes God uses the stuff we don't like to get us into a green pasture that we really, really need need have you ever cursed the thing that is promoting you to what you actually need i love when people tell me but it's hard <laughs> have you ever grown when it's really easy like we grow because it's hard what else the next little passage part of this has operative words in it it describes life 
as this learning to trust this good shepherd. Look at all these operative words. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me into the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Look at all these leading. It goes on to say, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are, say it with me, with me. Your rod and the staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. And then this one, surely, like I'm convinced. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced of this. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the cornerstone of the psalm. You can count on God's goodness and love to follow you all the days of your life. Not just the best days, not just on some days, but all of the days of your life. Anybody experience this can say amen in the room. Yes. This is what you get when you trade whatever shepherd, whatever's leading you, that you've been following for Jesus leading your life. This is what you get, his mercy and love and grace and goodness following you all the days of your life, leading you to still waters, leading you to paths of righteousness. He restores your soul, all of those things, being comforted. This is what you get when you trade whatever shepherd that you've been following for Jesus leading your life. And I would say most of us are following ourselves. So I want to focus on this one thing in particular for our last little bit. And this part of the psalm, this is the one I would have changed. Like if, if I were reading this, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. This is an interesting, interesting part of the passage. I don't know if you ever thought about this very much. But do you ever look at a scripture and ever think, I mean, you're probably not like this. I'm the only one that's weird like this. But sometimes I go, man, I, I'd probably change that up a little bit. Right? I would have said, uh, you know, if you are my shepherd, God, then you will prepare a table for me exclusively in your presence, God. Because if God's good and he's my shepherd, why wouldn't I just want to be with him? And by the way, the, the new Freddie message version would have added this part. And give me a window seat where I can see my enemies being scattered while I eat. I mean, it would just be an extra blessing that way. But it doesn't say that. It says, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Now, there's a lot to be said here. And, and one of the things I think about is this idea that God doesn't extract us from a broken world. I mean, have you ever thought about that? <laughs> I wonder if our efforts of being so separate from everything are often, because those things look really spiritual. But they're not really biblical all the time. Listen, I know, I made mistakes. We were talking about this yesterday. I have four kids. The first one, complete trial, right? Like just try, trying to do things right. I don't mean he was a trial. I mean it was trial by error. And you hope you're doing the right thing. They have no idea. You have no experience. They're like, they never ask to talk to the manager. I mean, they, they don't know. And you're trying so hard. And so I look back and I say, man, here's where I would have probably not allowed this. And did I mean, obviously, there are responsibilities we have with our children and all of that. But I just wonder if we've gotten so exclusive in our ways of thinking about our own spirituality. When it's such a communal effort. And the communal effort is not just with the people who are just like us. Rarely do we see where God extracts us from a broken world. Even though he walks through the valley of the shadow of death with us. What does it say? He is with us so that we would fear no evil. We're not trying to run away from all that stuff. We have the God of the universe with us in this mess. And we should have confidence in that. 
If all I'm trying to do is extract myself from a world, I must not have very much confidence in the God that I say I serve. And I'm just telling you, i got extreme confidence in this God. And again, I, I have ways I would write it differently, but, but I know that God says it different than me. And so, like, instead of this extraction from the broken world, he says, I prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemies. He sets a table for two for us in the presence of our enemies. A table for two. I might need some more lights here on the stage, guys. And you have been invited to dine with the king. At a table that is reserved for you, yet in the presence of the brokenness of the world. Now, as we, as we go with this illustration today, <laughs> you're not bad people, but you're going to be the enemy. Okay? And you are in the presence of this table that is set for me. What we have to understand is that in the middle of the circumstance, in the middle of the arrows that we feel that are coming against us, in the middle of all of the stuff and the brokenness and the cancer wards and the strife and the persecution and the difficulties, and let me just tell you, when you use the word persecution, just be really careful because you're putting yourself with people who've been killed for their faith, people who've been uh, put on a cross upside down for their faith, people who've been burned at the stake for their faith. So be careful about that persecution word because I don't think many of us have really been persecuted. We've just been really uncomfortable. But in the middle of that, even if we are persecuted, because David was, in fact, the, the scripture you mentioned this morning, I mean, this was a passage where David was running for his life and he was disguising himself as a crazy man so people wouldn't recognize that he was the king, that he was the, the anointed one coming. And in the middle of all that, this is the guy who says that the, that the Lord, the shepherd, the good God, who gives me everything that I need, that he prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Listen, he knew what enemies were. And I just want to tell you today that, that the enemy is not usually a person. There are people that can come against us, obviously. But the enemy is the enemy of your soul. The enemy is the one, and we're going to talk about this next week in a little more detail, but he's the one that wants to steal every good thing from your life. And it's only because he's jealous. It's only because he's evil. He really didn't even have anything against you personally. He just has something against the person who invited you to the table. And so he tries to get into your head. I have this word on the screen, invitation. Invitation. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. But I want you to think about that word. I want you to think about that word invitation. If you're taking notes, you should write that word down. Because that is a powerful, important word in this passage here. And God, the good shepherd, is inviting you to this table with things going on all around you, with arrows coming at you, and he's saying to you, He's saying to you, can, can you come? I, ha I have an invitation for you. I, I have this invitation for you, and I want you to, I want you to, to be seated, and, and if you can, just spend some time, time with me. And in this moment, imagine the God of the universe invites you to this table in the presence of all the other stuff. In the presence of the brokenness, he's inviting you to sit, to sup, to dine with the king. And imagine he's saying, man, how, how are you doing, Freddie? Like, like how, is, how is life really treating you? You know, I love being with you. 
I love to just sit and not only talk to you, but hear from you. What is this here? Oh, this is, oh, fresh grapes. These must not come from Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> That was a reference to last week. Just listen, Sophie loves Walmart, so we all love Walmart, okay? But here he is, giving you an invitation. He set a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Now, unfortunately, what often happens is that we like this idea, but we don't have a lot of time for it. Because this invitation is one that's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of our energy. We're going to have to put the phone down and really concentrate on this conversation. And here's what I know happens. Oftentimes, if you're like me, and I say that not in jest, like, like I'm this way too, is that I see this and I realize the importance of this invitation. I mean, I love God. Most of you do too. And he invites me to the table. Like we're not sitting in front of the TV eating dinner. We're not, you know, just grabbing something. We, he invited me to the table. And I come and I say, oh man, this is an invitation to the Almighty. Well, you know, I, I, uh, I really appreciate this, God, and I am, I am thirsty, and I am hungry, um, and I'm, I, I'm busy. You know how busy things are these days. Um, and instead of one meeting, I actually have two that are coming up, and of course you know, because I'm doing really good things, and maybe you're like this, you, you're busy doing really good things. You're taking care of your family. You're putting first things first. You're doing all the things you're supposed to do. I have responsibilities, Jesus. And so I, oh, I love this invitation. This is, I mean, look how beautiful this is. In fact, I mean, I know, I know all my friends would want to see. So, um, you know, I'm going to set my Bible here so it looks like I'm really spiritual. And, uh, man, this looks so good. Uh, I got to document this. Hold on just a second. No, that's not good. Let's see. Wait, okay. All right, good, good, yeah, all right. Um, put a little soft filter on that. <laughs> the apple's a little too bright. All right. Insta right now. You're my story. Boom. People are going to love this. Dinner with the king. I'll even title it that. All right, Jesus. Hey, look, I, I appreciate this. I might be back. But this is awesome. This is awesome. I'm going to let everybody know how great this was. I'll catch you. And instead of a beautiful invitation of a dinner with the king, what we desire in our fast-paced lives is a drive-through experience with Jesus. That's why we come to church 13 times a year. That's why your pastor has to stand before you and beg you to help out with kids once every six weeks. Because you're busy. You're doing good things. I mean, you know your kids aren't going to miss a rehearsal or a practice or a game or a homework assignment. And yes, serving is part of this dining experience. Because you're sitting across from one who led with servanthood. There's so much that can happen in these moments, and yet all we really, really want is a taste. Like, I'll take a grape with me. I'll get a bite. Yeah. And maybe I'll be back. But oftentimes when I come back, it's been so long the grapes are spoiled. I wonder what God really thinks about this. Don't give a, the enemy a seat at your table is what we're talking about these next several weeks. 
And what I want to say to you is this. The way that you don't give the enemy a seat at your table is for you to take your seat. Because this table is a table for two. It's a table for you and the king. It's a table for you and the one who absolutely loves you and adores you. It's a table for you and the one who wants the absolute best for you. It's a table for you and the one that restores your soul. It's a table for you and the one who leads you through the, uh, the shadow of the valley of death. It's the one with you and the one who delivers us from evil. The one who is with us through it all. The one who sees us when nobody else sees us. It's the one who holds us when no other holding can satisfy. It's the one who deserves all of our time, all of our attention, and yet we settle for a drive-through experience with God. And this is, this is meant to have us be introspective about this. Because there is an enemy to your soul and that enemy wants to steal from you and to take your place and to convince you you don't even deserve to be at the table. And we're going to talk about his tactics. We're going to talk about the ways that we can defend ourselves to, against that. We're going to talk about the ways that we can win this war for our mind that's going on all of the time. We're going to talk about all of that. But we cannot talk about those things unless we acknowledge that there is an invitation for us and there is a table before us. And it's for you and you and you and you and you watching online, it's for everyone, but it is a table for two. God wants this intimacy with you. He wants you to be intimate with the Almighty. What an invitation that is. There are lots of things that we cannot control in our lives. We know that. And sometimes we use that as an excuse but we absolutely can decide whether we want intimacy with the Almighty or if we'll be happy with the drive-through with the King. We can control that. One of my very favorite passages, and I'm not sure that Kevin even knew this, but he was quoting out of Psalm 34 earlier, and that was in 34.1. 34.8 is a passage that many people have heard. They may not know where it comes from. Again, but remember... The king was on a run for his life, David, and he said these words, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see <laughs> that the Lord is good. How can we taste and see? It's only if we take the invitation up for an invitation to dine with the king. That's the only way. Can I just remind you today, I'm going to have another student come up and we're going to read the 23rd Psalm. We, we have that. But it's going to be in the message version. And I want you to listen to it. But here's what I want you to remember. It's not what's at the table that matters most. It's who is at the table. That's what matters the most. Who is at the table? And God is so patient and so good that he waits for you to receive this invitation for a table of two. Listen to these words, Psalm 23, the message version. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from true to your word. You let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. Even when the way goes through Death Valley, I'm not afraid. When you walk at my side, your trusty shepherd's crook make me feel secure. You serve me a six-course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head, my cup brims with blessing. Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. I'm back home in 
in the house of God for the rest of my life. Thank you. We appreciate him. I'm back home. When we receive this invitation, it feels like home. Because this is the one who knows us best. It's the one who created us. The Bible says he created your inmost being. Would you stand to your feet with me for a moment? Would you bow your heads just not to be distracted by anything around you? We sang a, a song a minute ago that said, Jesus, you're my all in all. Is he? You see, when he's my all in all, then he's my shepherd. He's the one that leads me. And usually we only want to drive through experience of the king when, we, when we're in charge of our lives. We want a taste of Jesus, but we don't want the real thing. Because he's not our everything. He's not our all in all. I just want you to ask that question seriously of yourself today. Jesus, are you my shepherd? Are, are, you know, Freddie, is Jesus your shepherd? Freddie, is Jesus your all in all? Only you can answer that. But the one who invites you to the table, he knows. And if you don't want the enemy having a seat at your table, then you need to take your seat at the table. think about that today Kevin's going to play for us just for a minute let's just be still before the Lord in these moments you are the Lord upon my soul and you are the hands and won't you are the calm within the storm. You are the love that will endure. You are the victory in my fight. Over the darkness, you're the light. You are the hope I'm hanging on. You are my Thank you, Jesus, for inviting us to the table. Man, what an overwhelming thought. Thank you that you're a good shepherd and that you literally give us all that we need. We never find ourselves in want for anything when we find ourselves at this table, at, at the invitation of the king of our heart. And so, Lord, we want to be people who are restored. We want to be people who are led by you. So it's my prayer for all my friends today, whether they're in this room right now or watching online, maybe some other day during the week, and you're present with us all in this moment. And Lord, it's my prayer for all of my friends that, that they would ask the real question of what is leading me? Because if I'm being led by something else or even myself, I'm not going to take my proper seat at the table you've invited me to. So Lord, I don't believe it's super complicated. So you can meet needs of hearts right now. People can simply acknowledge with their heart and with their mind and with their mouths that they want you to be their shepherd, their leader. And when we do that, God, we'll be finding ourselves in this invitation of intimacy with the king. And, and we won't, we'll just be doing things and, and having disciplines that will reflect you and we'll be more like you. And we'll be serving like you. We'll be giving like you. We'll be loving like you. We will even lead like you. We'll lead others towards you. So I pray that that's a reality for many people today, God. Maybe there's people in this room who've lost their first love. Maybe they were really, really in love with you. 
and that they were at this table, but they got really busy with life and kids and jobs and school and furthering other parts of their lives that, that seem very separate from you. And God, maybe they've, they've walked away from their table with you. And Lord, I pray that they would feel not shame today, but they would feel a drawing that you give us back to you that they would sense this, this love, this being in love with their Savior. Lord, as the psalm just said, that they would come back home. And home is here at the table. So Lord, we do pray that as we enter this time, this season of sermon uh, topics, Lord, that we pray against the enemy. God, we don't fight our own battles. I believe that you're uh, always aware of us being in a spiritual battle. And when we go into things like these, sometimes there's the enemy coming against us because he doesn't want us to win this battle in our mind and our heart. And so we pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would protect us and that we would be doing the things necessary in our own disciplines to protect us, like staying in your word and being around other people who love you. And that we would see what you have for us, not only as individuals and not only as families, but as a church, God. You're always building your church. We want to be a people, a church of people who love God and serve all because we have found our place at the table that we've been invited to among our enemies. We are in the middle of this broken world and we are made to change this broken world with your help. Be with us as we go from this place today. In your loving, precious name, Jesus, we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. Do you receive the word of the Lord today? Can you give God praise in